hope, help, and healing with a hint of humor, Hashimoto's Healing. All right, welcome back, people. This is part three of my conversation with Dana Trentini from Hypothyroid Mom. Uh, in this section, we're going to answer some questions uh, from my Facebook support group. We got some amazing questions. Uh, due to the personal nature of some of these, I'm not going to thank each person for them. Uh, we're just going to talk about uh, these individual topics. Individual topics. Okay, so the first question I got was. Um, do antibody levels affect fertility? And if so, how? You know, Mark, this is, this is a really great question because um, I was surprised by the amount of research that I found um, regarding women who have normal TSH. Again, like, okay, that's very, there are issues with normal TSH, but okay. For normal TSH who had high uh, thyroid peroxidase antibodies, I was very surprised to see that even with a normal TSH, that they went on to have fertility issues and miscarriage um, and issues with pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting, right? So, yeah. you know, Hashimoto's, just having antibodies increases your risk of hypothyroidism, which as we know, increases your risk of pregnancy issues. But let's talk about the antibodies themselves and, you know, why why we think that might be um, a reason for issues for fertility. Well, we've talked about how if you have one autoimmune condition, you're more vulnerable to develop others. So is it possible that for some of these women, they're developing antibodies towards their reproductive tissues and the fetus um, is something very serious. And, and the immunological fertility testing, I don't think is routinely tested. So if you have Hashimoto's and you're just not being successful, it would be something worth investigating. Um, the other thing I think about, too, is that, you know, with Hashimoto's, you can cycle between hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. And we've talked about how thyroid and sex hormones are so intricately connected. Well, if you're cycling up and down and you're hypothyroid and you're having issues with progesterone, but then you're cycling to hyperthyroid and you have changes in your um, basal body temperature, you know, those temperature changes in the infl inflammatory stress I imagine, although I haven't specifically uh, read about it, but it would make sense to me that those temperature fluctuations and that fluctuation of hypo to hyper could cause, it, cause issues. Mm -hmm. um, what this brings, uh, a point that this brings uh, me to is there's a recommendation that I think everyone should know um, from the American Thyroid Association, and I'll read it to you. It's recommendation 19. It says, women, for th women positive for thyroid peroxidase antibodies and have subclinical hypothyroidism should be treated. Now, why is this a big issue, Mark? Because I have so many readers with high antibodies, but their TSH is normal and they're not being treated. And so we talk about, you know, there's, there's research about preventing the autoimmune attack from its further attack with treatment, but many doctors are refusing to agree with that. Well, now you could go in with the American Thyroid Association guidelines and say, listen, this is telling me that even if I have subclinical hypothyroidism that I should be treated because I have high thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And I think that's really an important piece. The yeah. other piece I'd like to say about Hashimoto's is I have so many women with PCOS. And I'm sure, Mark, that you see this all the time. Yeah. You know. You know, PCOS is another major cause of infertility and pregnancy issues. And so, I, you know how many women who tell me they have hypothyroidism and they have PCOS and no one has ever tested their thyroid antibodies? No one. Wow. So, you know, I'm, you know, I know you go in great depth at Hashimoto's Healing about all the great triggers, all those triggers that can cause Hashimoto's. Well, no one's testing their selenium levels and their nutrient levels and their adrenals and their and their parasites and their candida. I mean, no one is testing these things. And so it's just such a, for me, it's such a crazy thing. I, I have a feeling that the majority of my readers have thyroid antibodies and they have no idea because no one has ever tested them. Right. It's incredibly common. I mean, I think what this brings up is an important point, which... I'm constantly harping on, but it's really, really true that, that Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism is a multi-system disorder. It's not a single system. It's not just the thyroid. You know, and PCOS is a perfect example. PCOS is really, we've found 
very closely linked to blood sugar imbalances, actually. So interestingly, it's part of the whole, you know, that the pancreas, that's part of the endocrine system, that's part of... Who's so testing, but you know what? No one's testing their blood sugar levels right. and linking it together. No one, like, it's like these pieces of the puzzle that aren't being put together. Right. Right. Um, and that's, that's right. why I love your site, because you're bringing it together. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to the next question. The next question is, and you touched on this a little bit, so I know the answer, but let's ask it again anyway, because again, I think this stuff definitely bears repeating. Should you test your thyroid levels prior to trying to conceive? Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Yes, yes and yes, and yes. <laughs> you know, uh, I... Okay, uh, you know, they say, put it out in the environment, in the atmosphere, what do you wish for? In my lifetime, I will see thyroid screening in pregnancy. As a routine it. matter, yes. I will make, I will do something, and I'm in motion. Um, ideally, of course, you know, it would be great if, if women who are pregnant are tested, but the real ideal would be if women planning to conceive were tested so that, like we talked about, being as thyroid healthy as possible before you try to conceive. Well, boy, isn't it sad? You're waiting until they're pregnant and, and they might already have a serious health issue that's going to impact their pregnancy. It's kind of, oh my God, so twisted. So yes, before conception, we've talked about, you know, TSH is not, it does not give a full picture. So free T4 and free T3 and reverse T3 thyroid peroxidase antibodies, thyroglobulin antibodies, and also I think about antibodies for Graves. I have a lot of people with Hashimoto's that have the antibodies to both. Right. So, you know, um, I just think a more uh, complete history. And like we've said, it's more about the person. The lab numbers are just numbers. They're numbers, and we are more than the numbers. And so, uh, you know, my I'm really lucky because I have a doctor who goes by, when I step in the room, she doesn't pull out my labs. She sits in the room and I sit there. How are you doing, Dana? How are your symptoms? And then she pulls out the labs. So right. you see, like, it's a different way of thinking, right? It's, it's I want to know first from you, are you okay? Are your symptoms okay? Um, so again, the lab numbers. Now, the TSH, the American Thyroid Association recommends a TSH of less than 2.5. I've read a lot of thyroid experts that say 1 to 2. You know, I personally have a suppressed TSH. Um, that's where I feel my best on natural desiccated thyroid without any hyperthyroid symptoms. It's just where I feel my best. Yeah. Um, free T4, they say the top half of the normal range. Free T3, they say top half to the top quarter. That is huge for me because I feel terrible unless my free T3 is near the top quarter of the normal range. Yeah. Um, and, it, and I know, like, as soon as I start losing my hair, I, like, I know instinctly, like, okay, my free T3 is off somehow, um, mm -hmm. in addition to iron and other things with hair loss. But, you know, I have symptoms that get triggered if I'm, like, mid-free T3. It's an issue for me. And so we all need to know where in these ranges that we feel are best. Um, and so, yeah, so so it's all important. And I think the, the thyroid peroxidase antibodies and thyroglobulin antibodies, as we talked about, you know, there's a whole issue of even if you're negative for those antibodies, doesn't necessarily mean you don't have Hashimoto's. That's right. And we shouldn't just make the assumption that you don't. And in, in, in my world, because my keep testing negative, although my instincts tell me that that is the cause of mine, I just go by the assumption I have it, and I do everything that a, a person with positive Hashimoto antibodies does, and I feel great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, excellent point. Um, okay, the next question was, how soon can one get pregnant after starting thyroid meds? So like this I is kind of that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so individual, Mark, because yeah. we all start off at a different level. I mean, I have people with a TSH of 100. You know, I, I think that you need to get to a point where you feel healthy. And how long did that take me with my doctor? Now, for me, the key was natural desiccated thyroid. Now, for everyone, it's different. Um, I think that the majority of us um, benefit from T4 and T3, whether it's synthetic or natural desiccated thyroid, and that's a whole other issue. But um, when I found a doctor that prescribed natural desiccated thyroid, it took me, I would say it took six months about for her to continually retest me, readjust, 
get me to where I was feeling good. And I just did not try to conceive until the day happened. It, it was interesting because I walked into her office that day and she said, so how do you feel? And I looked at her and I went, you won't believe it. I feel great. And I started crying. Yeah. I feel great. Yeah. I feel, oh my God, I feel great. And then I started trying to conceive right after that. So, yeah. you know, it took me six months. You know, I think yeah. we're all we're all different. Yeah, so you need to be patient. You need to... You know, you need, it, it, you it'll, it'll like happen it. when it happens. You, you got to yeah. work with it. Yeah. Right. Um, next question. How do you know if your doctor needs to raise your dosage after you become pregnant? The majority of us need an increase in dosage. So yeah. uh, recommendation 13, American Thyroid Association. The 13. ones that are like were really relevant to me, I wrote them down for you. That's great. Um, Thank you. So recommendation 13, treated hypothyroid patients who are newly pregnant should independently increase dose by 25 to 30% upon missed menstrual cycle or positive pregnancy test. Now, this is a really controversial one because I think you have to be so careful to increase your meds on your own without your doctor increasing them. So what I would, would recommend is you have a discussion with your doctor about this recommendation you bring the guidelines into your office, into the office, and say, "Listen, this is what it says. What do you recommend I do? I want a lab requisition form so the day I have a positive pregnancy test, I go in for testing. My doctor agreed with this, so she told me, you know, based on your dosage, this is how much I want you to increase. I want you to go the same day for your labs, and then the lab. In my case, the lab take about a week for her to get the results, and that was how she did it." You know, many of us require even an, an increase of dosage up to 80%, you know, so we're all very different. I think you go with your instincts. I have told you the story of how um, I had gone in at, at three or four weeks. She gave me a dosage. Literally a week and a half later, I didn't feel well. I knew something was not right, and she just increased my dosage again. So I didn't wait. Even though it says go every four weeks for the first 20 weeks, if you don't feel good, you just call up your doctor, and it doesn't matter how many times, you know, as annoying as as you can be, because this is about you advocating for you and your baby. The other thing, Mark, I want to tell you is that, yeah. you know, I've read astonishing studies where small portion of doctors, including endocrinologists, have actually read these guidelines. Now, I don't think these guidelines are perfect because it's a really focus on TSH and, and levothyroxine, and but. The fact that maybe 11% have even read the guidelines, they don't even know a TSH of less than 2.5 is what's recommended. So my doctor was going, when I miscarried, my doctor was going by, if your TSH is less than 10, you're fine. Okay, so can you imagine? I was pregnant, I felt like crap, and she was saying, you know, no, your TSH is less than 10, what's the problem? What's the issue? So... You see, they, she clearly had not read those guidelines, and so it, even like bringing them in, I bring a copy, and say, okay, I want to discuss. I want to discuss the guidelines. Yeah, no, it's fantastic advice. And where can you get these guidelines that you're mentioning? Um, I would be happy if people want to come um, visit me. You could Google it, American okay. Thyroid Association guidelines for pregnancy. Okay. They could contact me at hypothyroidmom.com or on my Facebook page. Okay. I'm regularly like sharing. Yeah. And those kind of resources, yeah. so I'd be happy to do that too if people yeah, are struggling to find it. Yeah, you are a great resource, and we're gonna, at the, when we finish up, we're going to um, tell people how to, to access your information. Great. Okay, yeah. the next question is, um, and this is, I think, kind of leads like once you have the baby, there can be issues, of course, and we want to look at some of those. One person asked me this question, and I think it's a really interesting one. Is there a link between Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and autism? This is such a great question. It um, is. In August, you know, I, I had heard from a whole bunch of readers their kids were autistic and they had hypothyroidism. I even wrote articles about how, about studies that showed that maternal hypothyroidism resulted in lower IQ in um, fetuses as a result of maternal hypothyroidism. In the back of my mind, you know, I knew, okay, learning disabilities, special needs. You know, I'd heard from 80, you know, parents with kids with ADHD, parents with autistic global developmental delays. Well, I was really, um, I was happy because I think more awareness is needed. In August, the, the um, 
there was a study that reported that pregnant women with maternal thyroid dysfunction were had a fourfold increase in having children with autism. Wow. And I mean, I'd read the research before, but it was such a current, you know, it was in August 2013, and I felt like, you know, hello, you know, we need more research, come on, you know, if a baby... If for the first 12 weeks, that baby relies completely on maternal thyroid hormone, and there are millions of undiagnosed women in the world. Can you imagine the effects with, you know, um, developmental delays? And, like, it, it, you, you know, it doesn't take a study to link the dots, you know. Right. Come on, people, let's connect connect the dots. Right, exactly. And that's, that's my mission, too. That's what I'm constantly trying to do is connect dots and things. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, I recently took a course with Dr. Karazian all on brain health. And one of the things he was talking about was how gluten also impacts the brain. I mean, we know gluten is, in, is involved in the initiation of autoimmune disease. We know it can be responsible for uh, causing a more aggressive attack on the thyroid. Well, it turns out also that gluten can uh, actually attack or is responsible for attack of cerebellar tissue and brain tissue too. So, Scary stuff. Yeah, really scary stuff and you know I think again another huge reason to do everything you can prior to uh, trying to conceive um, to try to avoid some of these, these heartbreaking developments. And you, you know Mark, um, one of the, an important point um, I, I hope that um, one of the messages, because it can really sound like you know this is really scary information, which it is. Um, but I, I hope that there's also like uh, that the listeners are also thinking, you know what? There's actually a positive to this because if you know that there is danger um, with maternal hypothyroidism and, and Hashimoto's in pregnancy, you can have beautiful, healthy babies like my son Hudson. You can have them, and it's about being as healthy as possible before you try to conceive, and that you know, you know, you know, it's like you you make sure you prevent the things that might happen, and you have a plan. And I mean, I have a beautiful, healthy boy, and so I hope that there's also a positive that people say, okay, I get it, and now I'm going to make sure that I have healthy, beautiful babies. Right. I mean, it's really about being conscious. Mm -hmm. and it's really, you know. You be proactive, uh, don't wait. Okay, so the next question I had, I think, kind of is sort of related to this. You know, people are asking too about their children and concern about their children and their children's future with regard to Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. So, this question was if you have Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism, and especially if you had it during pregnancy, are your children more likely to have it? And at what age should they be tested? I, I get this question a lot um, at Hypothyroid Mom, and um, I don't think that there is, I don't think a child can be too young and get tested. Right. I mean, there are newborns that have hypothyroidism, and not in all parts of the world. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate that uh, the hospital where I delivered my son had neonatal testing that tested his thyroid, and unfortunately, he had a high TSH level. Um, he was delivered preterm. Um, and it resolved itself, thankfully. Um, but I understand that not all places in the world have TSH newborn testing. So I think if you feel something's not right, now my, my mom, you know, she can list like symptoms that I had as a baby, as a newborn. Um, I think that I've had it since then. And, you know, I she just didn't know, she didn't know to get me tested. So. If you have a child that's having symptoms, um, it doesn't matter how old they are, get them tested. I've had my children tested. My seven-year-old has some some symptoms I worry about, and so I plan to have him tested. My three-year-old was tested when he was a newborn and, and then had regular testing after that. So I, I don't think that they can be too young and be tested. Right, I agree. I mean, I also think, again, you know, we touched on this earlier, I, I think true prevention is really about behaving like they already have it and doing everything you can to to exactly you know work with them to keep you know it's as though like I said as though you have it so make sure they're gluten free make sure they're you know you're thinking about their selenium levels make sure 
you're thinking about the other factors of so stress and these other these other things, the blood sugar, the other things that impact the thyroid so dramatically and that can be the triggers. Absolutely, like we were talking about, you know, your 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 genetics do not des is it's not your destiny. You know, you can alter your destiny. And now that we know that there's a genetic a potential a genetic component to this, well, I like I like your attitude, and I do that right now. You know, I make sure my son has fish oil and is um, su supplemented properly, and I try his. Boy, he really likes gluten, so you know it's a struggle. But right. you know, I'm working at it and working at it, and and I just think that you know you just just be proactive. Exactly. Prevention. Exactly. All right. Well, awesome. I think that's all we have time for today. This has been fantastic, Dan. Gosh, you're such a wealth of information. Love it. I'm so really so. Art. I'm really so grateful that you took the time out to chat with me. Oh, uh, what a pleasure! Thank you. And uh, you know, you're doing amazing work at Hypothyroid Mom. And let's just, if people want to access you and information for you, can you tell us what's sure. the best way to do that? Yeah, my blog is hypothyroidmom.com. Mm -hmm. um, I get a lot of com um, comments on my blog, and I try my best to answer um, everyone. Um, although it can be challenging, but please, I, I love comments and I love so answering I my readers. Mm -hmm. um, Facebook, I have a rocking community. Um, yeah. My Facebook mark, Hypothyroid Mom Facebook page, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a place where people ask questions, they share what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and just a place for great support. And I also have uh, Twitter at Hypothyroid Mom if you're on Twitter. And yeah, I try my best to um, get to as many people as possible. And yeah. yeah, you know what? Hypothyroid Mom and Hashimoto's Healing, they wouldn't be what they are without our fans, Mark. So to me, like, they just rock. Like, I wow. totally agree. We have an awesome yeah. community, and they're great at participating and sharing and helping each other and supporting each other. And that's the, I think, the most important part of all of this is that we're really all in this together. And, you know, together we can beat this thing. But, we, you know, it's putting all our heads together and all our collective knowledge and our collective exactly. experience that's really helping everybody. Yeah, and I, I've loved watching Hashimoto's healing grow. I remember you from the very beginning when I started Hypothyroid Mom. Um, but, you know, Mark, what I like the most about you is I can tell you're, you're very sincere in that you care about your readers, and that comes through. And um, I applaud you for the work that you're doing, and um, like I said, I, I don't think that, I, I am in complete shock to this day that Hypothyroid Mom has the number of readers that it has, and I know it's my fans that yeah. made it what it is. It wouldn't be what it is without them, and they just rock. Yeah. yeah so. well, you rock too, Dan. I mean, we, Thank we, you. We without you. Thank you. All right, great. So, sign off. Thank you so much for joining us once again, people. That was Dana Trentini from Hypothyroid Mom, and my name is Mark Ryan, and you can check me out at HashimotosHealing.com or my Facebook support page at Facebook.com forward slash Hashimoto's Healing. Have a great day. Be good. Be kind. And don't forget to be compassionate to everyone, including yourself. HashimotosHealing.com